If I asked you when the welfare state started, you'd probably say 1945, and you'd be right. But what if you could trace the roots of it much, much further back in time to these ghostly ruins, to one of the most tumultuous and destructive periods of British history? This priory, Gisborough in Yorkshire, was founded in the 1120s by the ancestor of Robert the Bruce and was home to the Augustinian order. Christian monasticism emerged in North Africa and the Middle East in the 3rd century. Known as the Desert Fathers and Mothers, they would give up their possessions, retreat into the wilderness and devote their lives to prayer. This movement gradually grew and spread across the Christian world, with communities developing strict rules on how to live. All of these different religious communities functioned on essentially the same principles. They devoted themselves to God through prayer, work and solemn contemplation, away from the rest of society but they also felt a moral and spiritual duty to care for the poor. They opened hospitals, ran schools, and gave food and money to those in need. In 1535, a survey found that Gisborough supported 500 families with a special room called an almonry dedicated just to charity and an almoner responsible for making sure the whole process ran smoothly. The Priory also owned a nearby leper hospital, one of the only places where those with leprosy would be given the dignity of care and community. This was a time when lepers were cut off from society, often only permitted to watch religious services through a hole in the wall called a leper's squint, like this one in Selby Abbey. These small acts of dignity would have been immensely important to people, these religious establishments were the main and often only source of stability and charity in an otherwise nasty, short and brutish world. Even today, we find places of worship of all faiths to be at the centre of a community's social support. But during the 15th and 16th centuries, leading Protestant reformers began to criticise the monastery system. Most of these criticisms are valid, such as the exploitation of pilgrims and relics, the sometimes hypocritical lifestyles, and the overemphasis on the individual's spiritual life over their duty to pastoral care in the outside world. In 1533, Henry VIII was excommunicated from the Catholic Church for divorcing Catherine of Aragon. Taking advantage of the Protestant Reformation sweeping through mainland Europe, he declared himself head of the Church of England, and thus the Church's property became the King's property. What followed was an unprecedented period of destruction. Around 800 various religious buildings were shut down and their wealth confiscated, including Gisborough, which was one of the last to be dissolved in 1540. You now have a huge poverty vacuum. Everyone who relied on these places for food, work, money or healing finds that they are suddenly without any help. And you can imagine the social upheaval that this caused. We get a real sense of the desperation people felt from the petitions submitted at the time. One petition from 1545 in Bury St Edmunds said, There was not any hospital or other like foundation for the comfort or relief of the poor of which there is an exceeding great number within the town. He do now take the whole yearly returns and profit, and distribute no part thereof to the aid, comfort or relief of the said poor people. Another from 1538 read, The experience which we have had by these houses that already be suppressed showeth plainly unto us 
that a great hurt and decay is thereby come, and hereafter shall come to this your realm, and great impoverishing of many of your poor obedient subjects. Things became so bad that in 1536, there was an uprising of thousands of Catholics in the north of England known as a Pilgrimage of Grace. They were unsuccessful and the leaders executed for treason. This vacuum of poverty and instability forced the government into action. For the first time, the care for the poorest in society became a governmental responsibility. What followed over the next decades and centuries was a series of laws, known as poor laws, which laid the foundations for state welfare in English law. Most of these early laws consisted of punishing beggars and forcing them into work, but the middle of the 16th century saw the introduction of taxes, called poor rates, which would be collected and handed out to those in need. Those who were able to pay but chose not to were punished. For the first time, publicly funded welfare was enshrined in law. These poor laws would be adapted and improved on over time, but they would remain in place for the next 400 years, becoming some of the longest running systems of English law. The poor laws were officially abolished in 1948, with the passing of the National Assistance Act. When Labour won the election in 1945, they did so on the promise of a welfare state which would care for each citizen from cradle to grave. They did this because they believed it was the government's responsibility but what they and we may not have realised is that the roots of this responsibility can be traced all the way back to this tumultuous period in British history. <laughs>